Welcome to the Leadership Experience Podcast, where we seek to build connections, talk relevant issues about warfighting and share professional knowledge through experience and lessons learned with guests from a variety of different professional backgrounds. It's our way to relate to multiple generations within our formation and create real conversations as we build a team of teams committed to winning and dedicated to the pursuit of excellence. We hope you enjoy our content. You can continue to find the Lancer Brigade on Facebook and Instagram and find our podcast content on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts as you search for the Lancer Brigade or the Leadership Experience. Enjoy. Hey team, check it out. Today we welcome First Lieutenant Marshall Plumley. Marshall's a Ranger Qualified Infantry Officer who served in the Lancer Brigade over the past two years. Prior to joining the Army, Marshall developed his unique competitiveness and drive by playing Duke basketball while simultaneously being enrolled in Army ROTC. While Marshall ultimately went on to play professionally for both the New York Knicks and Milwaukee Bucks, his call to service prevailed. His contributions today will cover both his personal and professional stories as a young lieutenant whose desire to serve and compete in a different arena has contributed to the success of his soldiers and himself. Okay. Thanks for uh, We Are Marshall Plumley sitting down with us today and having this conversation before you head off to 375. That's pretty impressive that you made it, but thanks for sitting down today. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. So, you know, for uh, for those that don't uh, know, for, for the water, water audience, you know, that's going to be watching and, and listening in, we're actually sitting down with your uh, one of your two company commanders, and we'll get a chance to to sit down and maybe harass a little bit, reminisce some of the good things and hear a little bit about your story because it's pretty special. And I think those have not got a chance to, to spend as much time that both me, me and Nick have is I think it's per, important to share that with you before you take off. Absolutely, sir. Something so, I'm happy to share. Absolutely. So for those that don't know, I'm going to start off and saying, Hey, you know, that I had a chance, you know, as we were going through and uh, I was sitting in NTC and we had just ended up getting recocked for this big mission it was uh, on the objective of Razish. And I felt pretty bad because, you know, the entire time the, the brigade was having to come back and, and get recocked. <clears throat> and I felt like I'd, uh, I'd let the brigade down, that we were having to redo something. And I get this, this message that I've got to call General Brown. And so for those that don't know, General Brown, the former user pack commander, four-star General Brown, was my first battalion commander in the Army. And I was like, this is unbelievable. My first failed mission in NTC, and I'm getting a phone call to call my very first battalion commander in the Army, who's a four-star. And so I ended up talking to his XO, and, and he put me in touch with General Brown. And General Brown, ever, I mean, if you've ever heard, heard or talked to him, he's incredibly positive, you know, and he sounds the exact same way and the most personable individual from the moment I was a second lieutenant until today in our passive cross a couple of times. And of course, he's like, hey, John, how you doing? He's like, you know, it's great to hear from you. Incredibly proud of your taking command. And, you know, I heard you do, you know, just kick an ass at NTC. I said, well, you, you know, sir, I said, I, I figured you were calling me because, you know, I just failed this mission and I got to get recocked. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. That place is designed to, you know, make you fail and you're going to learn your lessons. You're doing great. He goes, hey, the, the, the real reason I'm calling you is because uh, there's this uh, lieutenant. His name is Marshall Plumley." He goes, uh, you got room for lieutenants there in 2-2? Uh, in I said, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, sir. He goes, Sean, this guy played at Duke. He plays for uh, Coach K. And you know my relationship with Coach K. I said, yes, sir, I do, absolutely. He goes, they want him to go to 101st. And I told him, absolutely not. He needs to go to JVLM, 2-2 two -two striker, and work for you, John. And in my mind, I'm thinking, like, this is, like, surreal. As I'm sitting up here, you know, I just had this engagement with the OCs, and they're telling me we got to recock. I get this call from my first battalion commander in the Army. And he's taking the time to sit there, and he's paying me this compliment where he wants this lieutenant who's just coming into the Army to come serve, you know, on the team here at JBLM. But, you know, the unique thing about having a leader like General Brown, which is a reason why he's a four-star, is at the end of that conversation, which was probably no more than about five minutes, was he not only was, you know, invested in you to get you out here to JBLM, at the same time, he had remembered, you know, the things and followed my path from the time that I was lieutenant and the things that he had done for me personally when I was lieutenant up to the time that now, you know, serving as a colonel. And just in that small little conversation, you walked away and I was like, okay, 
all right, let's go. Let's go do this mission again. I'm ready to go. <laughs> hey, and I'm getting a lieutenant, and I guess he's like seven feet tall, which is going to be like awesome, you know? <laughs> So when you're only like five, six, you can literally go home and tell people like you walk amongst giants. And I've been able to say that in every, uh, you know, unit I've served in. You know, we were talking with Villanueva previously, and he is not a small man. And neither are you, Marshall. <laughs> you know, and I think the first time that I did see you, we were at the State of the Brigade. You remember that? Yes, sir. Yeah. So I was walking around and, you know, the State of the Brigade and Brigade Commander stands up there and has this conversation and lays out, hey, here's the things we're doing well. Here's the things I need you guys to help with. Here's my philosophy. And as I'm like scanning through the crowd, I'm like seeing this like very large human. And I looked at his rank and his lieutenant and I thought this dude was standing up and I was about to get on you to tell you to sit down <laughs> until I realized that you were taller than me while you're sitting down. <laughs> so I don't know if you remember that uh, that day or not, but, you know, that was just the beginning. You were well known coming in. But it wasn't, you know, the notoriety of playing at Duke. It was what you did when you got here. And, uh, you know, I'll turn it over to Nick because, when you know, when Nick knew that he was taking Charlie Company, he's got his own story about taking command in his own unique circumstances. But, you know, Nick, when you found out Marshall was going to be your, uh, your platoon leader, what were you thinking? So the first thing, sir, Colonel Weatherell calls me. He's like, hey, you a basketball fan? No, sir, I'm not. I'm a huge Michigan State basketball fan because no. I, I, I thought I knew where this was heading. It's like you're getting a, an old Duke basketball player. Rewinding the tape 2015, I remember seeing Marshall Plumley destroy Michigan State in the Final Four. And I was like, sir, I don't know if I want him. In the back of my head. Start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the back of my head. And so we talked through it and everything. And uh, I'm like, all right, cool, new lieutenant. My first sergeant is a pretty rough dude. He's like, hey, sir, uh, first counseling. You should put a really small chair in the office <laughs> when he sits down. And I was like, I can't do that. Like, I'm not going to talk about basketball though. We're going to have a, a good army discussion just to see where he is, you know, where his mind's at. He comes in and I have my Michigan state mug on my, uh, on my desk. I'm not talking about basketball. I didn't mention the height, you know, even though he has a duck as he's walking through the, the office door and we start talking and he goes, you know, I played them in the final four. I go, I know who you are. Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> I go, I know who you are. So he leaves. First sergeant comes in and goes, sir, uh, how did the first counseling go? I go, I should have done the small chair. <laughs> Is that true, Marshall? Yes, sir. Yeah, it, it was true. Uh, and I just, uh, I had to let him know where I stood and remind him where Michigan state stood. Uh, <laughs> but no, I think, uh, if I remember that right. That you made it pretty obvious right from the beginning you didn't care about the basketball. You didn't care about the background. You came about what I was, you cared about what I was there to do. Uh, and you made that obvious with how you spoke to me and your actions. And uh, I think that really helped my development, sir. But basketball is a big part of your family and your life. Yes, sir. You know, so for the, for the team that's listening, how important it is, is basketball in your, in your family and you growing up? It's huge, sir. Uh, my mom played, my dad played, my brothers played. Uh, and playing in the NBA is something I always aspired to do. Uh, and it's given me this awesome set of life experiences that I've been able to in turn now share with my soldiers. Uh, and they probably get sick of all of the basketball analogies I use. You know, uh, today I was uh, talking about roles with soldiers. And I had to tell them about how I never had the green light to shoot threes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was trying to get a soldier to stop doing something. I'm trying to remember <laughs> what. But uh no, lots of analogies, a lot of life lessons learned. And uh, most importantly, sir, I feel like I've really come to understand what a good teammate looks like. Yeah. And I think that's applicable in the Army, basketball, yeah. and uh, I'm really grateful for that world experience. That's incredible. So, like, for those that know, right, all, all of you and your brothers both play in the NBA, or all play in the NBA, correct? Yes, sir. The two older, the two ugly brothers, uh, <laughs> some call them, they, uh, they play their little uh, – better hoopers uh, yeah. than I was, but I'm the best shooting Plumley, which uh, that doesn't mean anything because I think we're a free throw percentage around 40%, 50%, <laughs> 60%. But uh, college career, I'm, I'm one for one. Uh, I'm 100%. So uh, I think it's time for a heat check. I probably need to shoot a few more. That's good. That's good. Well, that's great too, right? So you're saying mom and dad both played in college? Yes, sir. They did. Uh, my mom... Um, She's the nicest lady. When you meet her, I actually gave her a tour of the uh, of the company yesterday. She's come helping me get my affairs in order, sir, transitioning to 375. 
uh, but you wouldn't know it. Uh, she is a mean streak to her. She has the foul out record at <laughs> Purdue. Uh, so I'd like to think I, I've inherited a little bit of that too. So yeah. I, I always prided myself on the ability to have fun with the guys, but when it's time to compete, to be able to turn that on, sir. Yeah. So no doubt, you know, growing up and being in an athletic or as an athlete, they, I guarantee you, they probably taught you about being in teamwork. You learn about competition. What do they teach you about loss? About loss. So on the best teams, uh, I've been a part of, sir. Yeah. Uh, losses have been miserable. Yeah. Uh, and we do a good job of making sure the, uh, the atmosphere and the mood around the locker room, yeah. uh, there, there aren't a lot of, there isn't a lot of joking going on. We, yeah. we, all we're thinking about is that next win. Uh, and when you end the season not winning the national championship, when you're coming off a loss, you've got a whole off season to kind of stew on that. Mm -hmm. It's great motivation, great fuel. And I feel like the greatest leaders in my life, Coach K in particular, has never missed an opportunity to take advantage of, of a loss, to use it as motivation and uh, you know really fuel us to reach that next mountaintop, sir. Yeah, so you know whether you realize it or not, that's like the beginning of you know this – you know, their leadership imparting on you about this thing about grit and resiliency, you know, and athletics and sports and all these kind of things and competition help kind of teach those things. So it's interesting, you know, your three brothers, you're the youngest. At what point did they recognize that you weren't the little brother anymore? <laughs> um, I think uh, when I was about a freshman in college, I started to be taller than them. Uh, <laughs> but really, they still treated me like a little brother. When it was time for a dunk contest, they, yeah. they'd bring me out and they'd jump over me for the, yeah. you know their finale dunk. And I kept getting little brothered. Uh, but I think it was really when I went away uh, in the active duty army, I spent some time at Fort Benning. Yeah. Didn't need to jump as high anymore. Spent some time in the gym and I came back and they, they did a double take and they're like, we don't know if we could beat you up anymore. I'm like, that's exactly the thought I want you to have. That's <laughs> how you should feel around me. Uh, so they'll always look at me as a little brother, uh, but I think they might think twice before giving me a noogie or something, sir. That's awesome. That's like, you know, when, uh, in the last dance when Jordan was talking about getting, you know, roughed up by the Pistons. Exactly. And then after they, you know, they lost like, what well, was like four zero where he went back on the off season, he started working out, picked up all that weight and muscle and came back. That's pretty neat. So, you know, it's interesting when people hear your story, you've got all this influence, you got to, you're going to a great school. You've had the experience to serve on a championship team. I mean, all this surrounded by you and you knew that, you know, there's this great influence to, to play at the professional level. Where does this thing join in the profession of arms come from? You know, I'd have to circle back to general Brown, who you mentioned earlier, sir. Uh, and you know, you mentioned most recently when he set me up for success by putting me on your team. Uh, but he set me up for success at so many different points. He'll just never let his hands off, uh, the reins. He's always invested. He's always uh, cared about me. And uh, he developed my passion for the military early on. I was a junior in high school. I went to play on a USA basketball team in Mannheim, Germany, where I think uh, General Brown was a one-star general at the time. Yeah. And, and shame on me. I didn't know anything about drill and ceremony. I just saw a tall soldier. <laughs> he could have been the same as any soldier. And, uh, I think I, I went up to him like, hey, buddy, hey, guy. Or, you know, <laughs> I, I can't believe. Uh, but anyways, he... He was very personable. And I told him, hey, I was interested in uh, joining the military. You're, you're a tall guy. You were able to do it. Is it something I could do? Yeah. And from that point forward, he was supremely invested in teaching me about the Army, what it had to offer, how it could make me a better person. And specifically, he said, uh, if you like being a part of something bigger than yourself, like you claim, Marshall, uh, there are two places you can go to do that. He's like, you can either go play for Coach K, like I did at Duke, uh, or you can join the army. And if you really want it bad enough, I think I can find a way where you can do both. And that's what he did. And it's something I never would have been able to do without his help. Uh, and so I'm really grateful to him, sir. And I keep trying to, to rack my brain of, of ways to, to pay him back, you know, thank you letters or thoughtful gestures. Yeah. Uh, and I'm learning there really isn't any way I can pay him back for him putting me in the position I am now. Uh, the only way I, I can pay him back is by paying it forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. He, he's an, he's a phenomenal leader, you know, and as I mentioned, as a battalion commander, when I came in, one of the things I noticed because, uh, I, I showed up to Fort hood and I did the extended stay at ranger school 
So that's what I tell people, right? Ranger school is as long as it takes. Yes, sir. You know, I did Darby twice. I did mountains twice. I did uh, Florida once. And by the time I made it to his battalion in two, five Cav, and I showed up because everybody tells you when you're down at Fort Benning, how significant it is to have a Ranger tab. There was two things that came to light pretty quick for me. Number one, my platoon sergeant was a staff sergeant, not staff sergeant promotable, Zayas Bazan, and he was the only Ranger qualified NCO in the battalion. And number two, Bob Brown does not have a Ranger tab. And, uh, you know, he, he brought that out in the first initial counseling. He looked at me and goes, hey, look at my shoulder. You're not going to see a Ranger tab. And you know what the reason that is? He's like, I struggled. I couldn't do the swim. He goes, but I make sure that every lieutenant knows the importance of going that. I never made a chance, you know, to go back and finish this. And he was, he was encouraging about everything. He didn't hide it. And then the, you know, the second portion about it was, is, you know, as a lieutenant, I was going through a divorce and, uh, you know, you talk about leaders that are incredibly vulnerable, that take a time to sit down with you, you know, talk through. And I told him, I said, Hey, sir, he said, Hey, what do you want to do? He's like, you want to be the scout platoon leader? You want to be a sport platoon leader? You want to go to Ranger battalion? And I said, Sir, I, I'm thinking about getting out of the army. And he was like, what are you talking about? And I said, I think I need to get out of the army to save my marriage. And at that point right there is where he stopped. And, you know, his family is just as great as he is. You know, when he comes back and he's like, hey, we'll sit down. He's like, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of lay all these things out. You know, if we need to sit down, you know, with your wife at the time and do all these things, he goes, we'll explain. He goes, because I know he knew my family as well and my dad. And he goes, I know that, you know, you love this thing called the army. And I'll never forget the advice that he gave to me. And he says, Hey, he goes, I, I just don't want you to make a decision where you're trying to, you know, run away or, you know, uh, you know, make a decision to try to prevent something because all it's going to lead to later on is resentment and regret. So he goes, uh, you know, if something you're going to do or some decision that you're going to make is, trying to prevent something that inevitably is going to end up happening, all that's going to lead to is resentment and regret. And I've never forgotten that the entire time he's ever told me that, you know, and, and as I've shared with the entire, you know, team before I ended up getting a divorce and he was right there, you know, Hey, pick me up, put me in a you know key position, put me with the right leadership. And it was an incredible team that he had there. And then the last thing, just, you know, a, a part of it for me is I got to see him when I was getting ready to go to battalion command and he brought up in front of all these, you know, future battalion and, and brigade commanders there at Leavenworth. When he was a battalion commander, they were running gunnery. I don't know if he shared this story with you. And they were out on a gunnery range. And uh, one of the crews that he had ended up uh, going through the engagement, you know, on one of these tables and slewed to the uh, right past the range fan and identified a target, which was an Apache longbow and engaged. And ended up destroying that helicopter. And when he told me, he said, hey, as I was going through that entire process, right? Other peers were telling me, hey, you're not going to survive and all this. But he had learned so much from that experience. And he was willing to share and be open and vulnerable about it. He was really one of the first leaders that I had ever known since the time that I was a young lieutenant to the time that even while I was as a battalion commander. Now he's a three-star general, you know, sharing the story about, hey, you know, this is something I went through as battalion command and I was able to weather through this. And then the last thing that I remember him talking about is when he was here at JBLM, he talked about this experience where he had partnered with the Seattle Seahawks with Pete Carroll. And they did this thing called a great teams, you know, event where they got together, you know, they shared, they talked about, you know, what their core values were. And they did this partnership and, you know, and the Hawks ended up having a great season. It was something they wish they continued. So, you know, it's, it's great to hear that, you know, we didn't even know each other. And I get a phone call and the experience that you're talking about with, with uh, Bob Brown resonates with a lot of people. And I guarantee you, if we had people that also had served with him or shared some other stories, you're going to say that dad's an unbelievable leader. Yes, sir. And, and when you talk about being able to be vulnerable uh, with your soldiers or with your peers, immediately what comes to mind to me, I say that's a secure leader. That, that's a leader who's secure in who he is and what he brings to the table, doesn't feel the need to uh, sugarcoat or cover things up. Uh, and what comes to mind when you also talk about uh, General Brown, sir, and how you guys were vulnerable with each other was the state of brigade that you mentioned earlier in the podcast. And yeah. uh, Captain Ando uh, sat us down. 
uh, myself and my peers after your state of the brigade and said, hey, what were your takeaways? And uh, me and my neighbor PLs, we kind of looked at each other and said, we've never had a commander be so forthright and so upfront about uh, things in their life and, uh, you know, things they've been, storms they've been able to weather. And it just made us feel more in tune with our leader uh, and like we could trust him more. Uh, and it motivated me to want to open up to my soldiers, sir. I don't know if you remember that. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, also failing to be vulnerable or to talk about the lessons learned, I feel yeah. like I'm robbing my soldiers of some of those lessons. Yeah. And I let them run the risk of making a mistake I already did. Uh, so why not uh, give them the scouting report, uh, so Absolutely. to speak? Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. You know, it's, you know, as a leader, you got to be able to laugh at yourself. You got to be able to be open, you know, in order to make that connection. Otherwise, you're, you're going to limit the number of dimensions that they see of you. And so even just like in the experience that we had, and I'd seen some work that you'd done and, you know, the, it's awesome where, you know, you had the, uh, you know, that little exercise with all your, shol your soldiers and who could build the highest tower out of, you know, the, you know, the, the dough and the, and the spaghetti or whatever it was. I thought that was pretty neat. That's a huge team building. It's creativity. What, how do you come up with that? Uh, you know, I think uh, Captain Ando and I, we try to pass books back and forth a lot. Uh, he, he's a big reader, bigger reader. I should read more. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> You're uh, doing all right, Marshall. <laughs> yeah, some, some of these, uh, I think it was a Malcolm Gladwell book probably. Uh, I but, think it was, it, was, it was Dan Coyle, actually, the marshmallow test, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it was a way to assess IQ and your ability to work in teams, and it's to, yeah. to build these marshmallow towers out of spaghetti sticks and marshmallows. Yeah. And we're in a dispersed training plan at this point. We've just been uh, hit with probably the most severe uh, restrictions in the COVID-19 kind of uh, isolation, sir. So we were trying to think of creative ways to stimulate soldiers' minds and get them involved. And uh, Captain Ando had tasked me with coming up with a, uh, a single soldiers event, a kind of a boss event that they could do from their barracks, Yeah, which is a kind of a challenge. That was a, a, a brain twister trying to think of something fun they could do that was budget friendly. Um, and uh, I think Captain Ando is like me and that uh, we really appreciate the little things. Yeah. So at, at first glance, marshmallows, spaghetti sticks, what, what's the most that could come of this? Uh, but we, we saw it as an opportunity to do something bigger. Uh, and we took it and we, you know, we're Centurion Company. It turned into Centurion Creativity Bowl. The soldiers That's really cool. bought in. Uh, then all of a sudden, the battalion caught wind of it. Yeah. And then the other companies are wanting to get involved. And then all of a sudden, the video from the Centurion Creativity Bowl made its way up to Brigade. Yeah. And then I, I believe you saw it, sir. I did. And it opened up an opportunity for our company to do a striker demonstration, you know, yeah. video extravaganza and represent the Brigade. Yeah. And all of this came from some marshmallows and some spaghetti sticks <laughs> and it, it, it sounds silly, but, uh, I, it just another one of those times where I'm like, man, the little things, they can turn into big things quick. That's a great point, right? So for any leaders coming in, I, there's really like kind of two things. So, so one I'm hearing as you're describing, Hey, I, I don't really, I didn't read as much as my boss. So you put something in my hands, right? And a lot of times, and I was the same way as the lieutenant. I didn't want to read it unless somebody was assigning it to me, you know, <laughs> but there's, there's gotta, if you're a, a truly a lifelong student, you know, of this profession, you've got to read and you've got to be open to read other things and, and open to read other things that you may not necessarily have an interest in. It helps, you know, expand your mind and, and be in a better critical thinker, but it is interesting. And what would you offer to, to leaders that are in the brigade or leaders that are coming into the brigade? When guys that see you and they're like, I'm not an athlete, let alone play basketball or like basketball, how do you make a connection with soldiers that may not have anything in common? For me, I've had the most success uh, making connections with my soldiers I might not have in common, uh, things in common with by putting us in an environment uh, where uh, backgrounds don't really matter and, and there's a, a common goal and we've got to share in the work and get it done. Yeah. Uh, most recently, you know, I, uh, I got the, the chance to, uh, to work out with these, uh, these sandbags, they call them the worm. Yeah. And they're yep. about 10 feet long. They yep. weigh about 450 pounds 
And it builds teamwork the way it would build teamwork if you and I were tasked with moving a couch up five flights of stairs. That's like right. We're, we're going to become very familiar really <laughs> quick. Uh, and and I, I saw these being used, and I'm like, I got to get that for my team. I, I've got to get that for my team. And, and we have one now uh, at our company, and uh, the guys are going to have a blast with it. It's going to break down those walls and put them in an environment where a guy who might not talk that much, he has to talk. That's right. Because he's got a 400-pound you know, monster on his back. That's right. Uh, you know, my platoon, we're the fighting ferrets. We're calling it the ferret. You know, we're putting a <laughs> tail on it and everything, sir. Uh, it's <laughs> and so, you know, we're, we're fostering the identity. We're, we're building some teamwork. And, you know, hey, I know you might be an introvert. I know you might not talk that much, but we're going to go out and do something today uh, where we're going to learn how you are as a teammate. Yeah. Uh, because you have to help us or we're not going to get this done. Yeah. I think that's a great point because you really, you know, at any point, you as a leader got to find the right environment. Because I do believe that everybody has some type of special, special, you know, unique power, superpower. He's got to find the right environment to bring it out of, right? And so for the team that does not track in, you know, the the thing with the worm, that's what they use in the in the CrossFit team games, yes, right? Sir. So it's not like if you and I were, were uh, you know, buddied up and we were carrying a log, you're going to carry it and I'm just going to like jump <laughs> up and try to touch it the entire time, right? But in, in the worm... I mean, because it's 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 not sturdy like that. All that weight's going to disperse, and everybody's going to end up carrying, you know, some part of that 450 pounds. So you're definitely going to learn about you know who's carrying their weight and who's not. Amen, sir. <laughs> That's awesome. Tell me about this medicine ball volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> so I um I I think uh, Captain Ando's always had a philosophy with our our company. Yeah. That uh, if it's safe. And it makes the team better. Yeah. You know, you, you don't need to bog this down with some decision-making process running it by me. Do it. Yeah. Execute. And this one maybe towed the line with the whole, if it's safe, definitely made us better. <laughs> but it's <laughs> it, it's a it's a brutal game that I, I am a firm believer would be huge for ACFT improvement. Yeah. Uh, and we go to a volleyball net. We use a padded medicine ball. And you do ACFT style throws back and forth. Um, and, and it's a smoker, sir. And it's something I I've seen it. Uh, I, you know, I actually looked up the history of it. It's called Hoover ball. I think president <laughs> Hoover was the first to invent it because I was getting a lot of credit for it. And then I think I felt uh, guilty cause I saw a Pittsburgh sealer player do it at some point. Uh, so I didn't invent it. Uh, but I, I may have coined it a little bit in our battalion. We called it ferret volleyball, sir. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it's kind of cool for me. My background as an athlete, yeah. really excited about the ACFT because I feel like it covers a more holistic approach at an athlete. And uh, while I might struggle with push-ups, you know, yeah. being a seven-foot guy, you know, I'm built like a trebuchet. Like I can huck a medicine ball, <laughs> sir. Like, and uh, so I get really excited to bring all the soldiers out to play ferret yeah. volleyball. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I can throw some meteors, sir. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, so when you go down to your next uh, organization, down to 375, what will you take away from the leadership of Captain Andosvic and Captain Sprouse? So, sir, I uh, I think one thing I struggled with coming in uh, to uh, your brigade was I, I really uh, liked to be liked a little too much. Uh, and I, I'm worried it maybe influenced some of my decision-making. And I think both Captain Sprouse and Captain Ando have cared more about developing me and pushing me to be better than yeah. they did about me liking them. <laughs> I, I, st I, I still like you, sir. Uh, but, Thank you, Marshall. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it's one of those when you're on the other side of it or you finally cross that bridge or they're trying to yeah. develop you in a certain way and, and they're pushing your buttons to get you there and you, and you finally turn a corner – I can look back and I can see, oh, now I understand why you did the things you did. Now yeah. I understand why you held me accountable, why you called me out. Yeah. And a lot of those lessons I've learned from them, uh, sir, I'm going to try to carry forward with me uh, into, you know, the most professional organization. Uh, and I think it's something I need to come ready with because I'm going to get that right back. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's, that's a great point, right? So as you're looking at it, it's this self-accountability. It's this willingness to, to be better and this, this willingness to absolutely say that, Hey, you know, I accept the responsibilities of whatever our shortcomings are and get better at it and know that, you know, we've, we've said this several times with different guests, you know, a lot of times, 
you don't necessarily know who your coach Shiano is going to be or your coach Bears or your captain on Dosvig or captain Sprouse is going to be. And a lot of times they may not give you the love that you want, but they're going to give you the love that you need, you know, yes, and sir. it doesn't matter if we're talking company commander to platoon leader relationship or if we're talking, you know, a team leader to a, a soldier relationship. I mean, there's, there's command sergeants, majors, active and retired. If you sit down and you talk about what they've learned, like life lessons, not just how to survive and, and, and be successful in this professional, you know, or in this profession, they're talking about how they grew them and raised them into the, you know, a good portion of the, of the manhood or in the adulthood that they are today. Yes, sir. Absolutely. What would you say? What are you going to take away from this guy that you can share that says, hey, this is what right looks like when you want to have a, uh, a lieutenant be successful? <clears throat> So you're hitting a lot of the high points, Marshall. I, I think a lot of the things you're saying, it, it's true, no doubt, but you're missing the important part. You know, you have an infectious, positive attitude. You, it, that's, a, that's a rare trait, an infectious, positive attitude in every single situation, you know, and it made the whole company better. I, I, I think we did have a perfect storm of amazing lieutenants, you know, Josh, Nelson, Chris, you, first sergeant. We had a, an amazing team, but the infectious, positive attitude, like your, your laugh, you joking, like he's a pretty witty guy. We'd be in terrible situations and he would not terrible, but austere conditions. And he would make a joke and I'd be like, come on, man. <laughs> right now? So that's, that's really it. And we had that discussion at first. Cause you talked about like wanting to be liked or whatever, or, you know, well, should I, should I change my approach to leadership? And I said, just be yourself. That's it. You know, yes, sir. soldiers will, will see through a, a disingenuous attitude. And they always will. And that's, I think it was a turning point for you because you had a positive attitude the entire time and it's infectious. Everyone feels it. People compete. You know, you put the ferret thing on the wall, you paint your office green <laughs> and then <laughs> Lieutenant Nelson paints his office blue and has like a, this confusing logo. I'm like, all right, let's compete. Good. <laughs> yes, so, sir. Th that's yeah. the, the big takeaway, sir. Is just yeah. the simple things such as attitude makes a huge difference in an organization. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a great point, right? So it's it's a lesson that I share with my son is never surround yourself with joy thieves. So, you know, you, you, you've already talked about the stuff that your mom and dad have laid out for you. You know, you see, you obviously, they grew up with a lot of sense, probably a strong set of values, a great work ethic, this thing about competition, overcoming shortcomings, being a great teammate, it puts you on the path. You meet a great mentor like, you know, Bob Brown, you know, allows you to be able to fuel both passions that you have. Then you come over here and you're meeting leaders on this path of the profession of arms that are absolutely going to make you better because those are the ones that can see something inside you. Because we all want to believe that we know what our potential is, but you're not really going to know until somebody sees this something that you didn't think and they're going to constantly squeeze on you, you know? And the, and the ones that I truly believe, you know, I think it's natural. I think we all want to be liked in some aspect of it. And I think as I get older and older, what I offer to my son is, you know, being liked is one thing. Being appreciated is is something different. And it's hard, right? I always tell them that life's going to give you one of two things, a great story, you know, or a great experience. And sometimes you'll end up getting both when you end up realizing what appreciation is. And you'll, you'll value that relationship a little bit more when you ended up separating from Andosvik and Sprouse and then move on again. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's good, you know, so when you, uh, when we're talking about, you know, starting in this next thing, how difficult was it to go to, uh, to go to ranger school and then get your EIB, you know, and what does that mean now kind of comparing to, you know, winning a championship at Duke? So, sir, uh, I guess when I think about, I'll focus on ranger school and the national championship, sir, uh, because they're both examples of great things I could never comprehend accomplishing by myself. Yeah, you know, the idea point. of me carrying a team uh, to a national championship. I don't know if you ever watched any of my highlights. There aren't a lot out there, sir. <laughs> uh, uh, that's not something I could do, sir. I uh, saw one where you were dunking on somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had that figured out. Coach K said I, I had the green light to uh, do as many wide open dunks as I could ever, you know, I could have my fill of those, but red light everywhere else. Um <laughs> But uh, no, l looking at Ranger School and the national championship team, yeah. uh, I remember on that national championship team, there was a certain point in the season where we had turned a corner. And I remember before the games, we would come out and, and I would look around the locker room. And I'd be like, holy crap, 
how are they going to stop us? You yeah. know, uh, if they stop me, you know, we've got Jaleel Okafor. How are they going to stop him? Yeah. They, they stop him. Maybe they stop him. How are they going to stop Quinn Cook? How are yeah. they going to stop Tyus Jones? Justice Winslow. I just had supreme confidence in the guys on my left and right. Yeah. Um, same thing in Ranger school. I, I was really blessed, sir, with I had a squad of half enlisted, half officers. We all went straight through together. None of us recycled. We kept the squad together the whole time. And any time we were given an upward brief or we were hit with a challenge or an obstacle course, it got to a point probably about through Mountain Phase, sir, where we had confidence. I'd look around and I'd say, you know, hey, my buddy, Burden, Carson Burden, he's got it. Or, uh, you know, th this this private uh, Nestor yeah. from uh, Ranger Battalion, he's got it. He's going to yeah. lead us to victory here. And uh, I knew at different points, it's human nature. One of us would fall a little bit short. Yeah. But together, we weren't going to let the team fall short. Someone was going to pick up the slack. Yeah. Uh, and, and it was just so cool. Two examples of things I couldn't have done by myself, sir. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. I mean, that it's... I think both those experiences share and teach you a little about yourself, but I think that the, the theme and the message you're continuing to echo is about the importance of being on a, a great team, you know, being on a great team, being a great teammate, you know, and the lessons you're taking away from that. What, what I would share is, you know, my Ranger buddy, when I ended up recycling uh, mountains and then we went together through Florida and I stayed in touch with him afterwards, he was a pack clerk for first Ranger battalion. And I'll never forget, right? And it's it's kind of funny. His uh, his last name was Gutierrez, which is the you know same last name as my wife's maiden name. And so one night, as I'm walking in the uh, in mountains, and you know you got like 75 dummy cores on you, you know. So as you're walking around, and something tripped me up in the middle of the night, and of course you took one step, and I did probably like three somersaults and hit the ground. And as I fell, right, the saw came down and and crashed on my face. And there was no, nothing said. He walks right up. He picks up the saw. He cuts the dummy cord, attaches his, picks me up, you know, takes off, untangles me, gives me his M4, pushes me in front, and he keeps going. I mean, and, and every time, right? And he was the guy that had the experience of being in an airborne unit. He didn't have to say anything. He was like, hey, let me see your rucksack, right? He would verify, check this, that, whatever. And that was the first time I saw, right? He was also the one that kind of called people out, not, so, not pulling their weight. And so, you know, when it came to Pierce and stuff, guys didn't want to, you know, rank it very high because he was the guy that was calling them out. And uh, I remember that. That was kind of the first sign. And I, I use that as a, as a strength. So when I rated him, I rated him pretty high because that's somebody that, you know, guys didn't appreciate at the time, but he was making the team much better. Yes, sir. I think that's powerful to have a teammate where there's that trust there. There doesn't need to be a word spoken. You know he has your back. Absolutely. And the analogy I'd put in basketball, you know, there there's some uh, scary moments for me where I'm guarding, you know, a quicker player out on the three point line, a place yeah. I shouldn't be. That's not my comfort zone, <laughs> and I don't I, I don't have eyes in the back of my head. I don't know if anyone has my help. Yeah. Uh, but on the best teams I've been on, yeah, I don't even need to hear anything. I don't I don't need to uh, see anything. I know. Yeah, that I've got a teammate behind me ready to help me if yeah. that, uh, you know, if that basketball player blows by me. Yeah, he's there ready to come over, help side, block the shot. He's there ready to, to pick the saw up and lift me off the ground and brush me off. Absolutely. Doesn't need to say anything. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm trying to think of more ways I can uh, develop that trust of my soldiers so they know I'm going to be there uh, yeah. without a moment's notice or without a word. I love that story, sir. Absolutely. What does it mean when you received your uh, expert infantry badge? It was special to me, sir. And, and what was uh, most special to me was uh, how I earned it and the people I earned it with. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple points I want to highlight. Uh, one, how I got the opportunity. Uh, and I don't understand the, the full picture, but from my perspective, there were a limited amount of spots with another team, more specifically uh, 275 out, out here at JBLM. Yeah. And uh, a lot of names are being thrown around with who should go. And, and my company commander, uh, Captain Ando, this is one of the, the many times uh, he really fought to get me in there. Yeah. And that was a cool thing to have a leader fight for me. Yeah. Uh, and, and something I want to carry forward with me. I want to make sure I'm fighting for my soldiers to get them opportunities. Absolutely. So Captain Ando fought to get me in there. 
then I'm in there and, and I'm surrounded by uh, Rangers. <laughs> and it's uh, especially so early in my army career. Yeah. The coolest thing. Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, I had an uh, appreciation for their work ethic and uh, how willing they were to help me yeah. uh, because I, I wasn't just sliding in under the radar. I'm, I'm this new seven foot guy around the footprint, uh, you know, probably drawing uh, some, some stairs, uh, but, but they welcomed me in uh, and the same uh, discipline and directness that they used on their privates. They applied that to me. That's great. Uh, and I benefited from it. And it, we talk about developing passions, the way general Brown developed yeah. my passion for the army. Captain Ando fighting to get me into EIB. Yeah. He developed my passion for wanting to be a part of the Ranger Regiment. Yeah. Uh, so that was another cool part that was uh, about that, uh, sir. And then yeah. at the end, uh, just having Captain Ando and my platoon sergeant, which was really special at the end of that 12 mile ruck uh, to pin on, you know, the true blue EIB badge. Yeah. It was a really special moment. So th those three things, sir, are what made uh, my EIB yeah. really special for me. Yeah, that's good. I mean, part of it is, is, is having, just as you mentioned, the opportunity. And a lot of times, if you don't put the preparation in every day, then you're going to miss the opportunity. And a lot of people miss opportunities, right? Because it's disguised as hard work. And that's so right. if you don't put that prep in every day, and then the moment they show up and goes, hey, guess what? We can send three people to 275's EIB. Who's ready to go? It's not, well, sir, if I had, you know, an extra month to do PT, hey, sir, if I get, you know, it's who raises their hand, who runs to the line fast enough, who wants it. And so, you know, a, a leader once told me combat was measuring opportunities. I've also expanded it and says, I think family, you know, and the opportunity to spend time with family is measuring opportunities as well. But if you don't put in the prep every day, you're going to miss it. And so uh, it's great to hear that, you know, when you have that experience and now this is one more thing you're going to take on that you realize, right? Cause with your soldiers, you're not raising those soldiers and you're not raising your leaders to be you. You should be raising them to be better than you, right? Yes, By giving them opportunities or afforded opportunities that you may not have. So I'm glad that you had that, that positive experience. Cause I know when you went, wherever you go, you're going to do the same thing, just like general Brown has instilled in you from early on. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So what does it mean going, going from here or what would you say, let's, before we go into where you're going to go next, what would you share from any Lieutenant that's planning on coming into the Lancer Brigade, uh, offer with them? Hey, what can they expect coming here? You know, how do, how do you need to prepare yourself? What should you understand? You know, what is this organization about? Uh, yes, sir. I, I would, uh, tell them from day one to be prepared to be challenged, uh, and uh, it came at me in a lot of different ways. It came at me from my company commander, giving me challenging uh, taskings and uh, new, uh, you know, new objectives to hit with my platoon, new goals to set. Uh, it came uh, from my battalion, uh, you know, with different, uh, you know, different projects. And then a cool one for me, sir, that we've talked a little bit about was the brigade squad competition. Yeah. You know, uh, we compete once a month, all the squads in the brigade. Uh, you know, to, to test our ability to, uh, you know, be experts of our craft and to yeah. improve on that, build on that. Uh, so just since day one, since I've been here, I feel like I'm always competing, competing. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's a great thing. Uh, it's a, a thing where you need to really take care of yourself and take care of your mind and body and find a balance uh, because you don't want to come into a fight or come into competing something you're not ready for. Uh, so I've had to really take care of myself. Um, and then my big takeaway, sir, that I would want to pass along to other lieutenants is, uh, and I just gave this advice, I just, I'm ripping out with another PL and I gave him the same advice, is that's to, to live your best life, to set really high goals for yourself, uh, do awesome things, and then just bring a soldier with you. Yeah. Uh, it ha has never taken away from any experience of mine to have a soldier, another leader there with me. It's only enriched it. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm getting ready to go hike Mount Rainier one weekend. I'm going to do it no matter what. It's something <laughs> I, I want to do. Why not bring a soldier with me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And in a lot of instances, it ended up working out that, hey, Plumley, you, you spent the last couple weekends working and uh, you, you've been with your soldiers. That wasn't work at all. That was something awesome that Absolutely. I wanted to do. It didn't feel like work. Uh, and I'm developing more touch points with my soldiers. 
Uh, they're more willing to go the extra mile for me. And we're getting to do awesome stuff I would have done anyways. Yeah. I want to watch a movie tonight. Instead of that, why don't we go throw a movie night at the cough? Why don't we all watch a movie? Um, little things like that. I, I would encourage lieutenants, uh, but it involves me leading a healthy lifestyle and me having goals. You know, I'm going in the gym to work out a second time in the day. Yeah. Let me take a soldier with me who's maybe struggling with his PT. He's going to work out with me. Yeah. Uh, and then what's really cool is when we turn the corner and sometimes soldiers are asking me to come do things with them. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's what I'd pass along to new lieutenants, uh, sir. I, I think that's incredibly sound advice and it, it demonstrates a, a lot of increased self-awareness. You know, the, the thing that I think that a lot of officers don't realize and they have a little bit of regret is the time that you get a chance to truly spend with soldiers is limited. And every day that you show up to work is one less day you get an opportunity to spend, you know, with a treasure, you know, and, and if you don't realize that when you're with soldiers, you, you feel different, you have more energy to do things because when you end up, you know, no longer, you know, being around soldiers because you're, you're stuck in a cubicle or you're doing something else, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss those opportunities to play medicine, volleyball or ferret ball or whatever you're calling it. Right. <laughs> you know, making marshmallow you know, spaghetti <laughs> towers and those kind of things. I mean, those are the special moments. And, you know, when you get to be an old guy like myself, which, which is really neat is a lot of times, you know, uh, you know, a great mentor is offered to Nick and I, a lot of times that you got to make sure that you, uh, you know, that you tell your soldiers and you make them believe they're on a winning team. You always tell them that you appreciate how, how much your work ethic is and that you're, that you're proud of them and that you find ways to tell them, that you love them. And, and I think by doing that, just as you mentioned, it's, it's not just spending the time with them. It's that reciprocal invite. It's that reciprocal note that says, Hey, sir, I can't wait to see you come back and be a company commander. I can't wait to see you be a field grade. Tell me where you're going to go next. That's the stuff that really matters, you know? And as you come back to that process of it, when you get out at some point and, and all these guys have, have moved on and done something different, and they hear that you're in town or you hear that one of those guys are in town and you're like, Hey guys, so-and-so's in town for one night. Let's link up. And everybody stops what they're doing. Those are the same guys that were complaining that, Hey, why do I got to go to this hell and farewell and all this, but <laughs> they'll remember, they'll remember all those little things you guys did outside. So I think that's great advice as you're going through. So as you get ready to transition, you know, for the team that's listening. So Marshall's going to head down to third range battalion which is pretty awesome. You get a chance to be in, you know, an elite infantry unit and demonstrates a lot of things. You pick up the charter. What does that mean to get a chance to serve an organization like that? Uh, it's exciting, sir. Uh, it's something, uh, you know, the team I'm on right now here at JBLM and how much people have invested in me to get me to this point. I really want to make them proud. Uh, so pl plenty of motivation going in. That's great. And, and in some ways, there's some parallels or some uh, some phrases I've heard that, that I've heard before, uh, which has got me excited. And that, you know, when I'm getting ready to go uh, play in the NBA, they say, hey, Plumley, you might be the highest jumper on our team right now. You might be the strongest. Uh, you might be the best X, Y, or Z. Get ready. You get to the NBA. Everybody's like that. That's right. So then what are you going to bring to the table? What's special right. about uh, Marshall Plumley? I've heard the same thing about uh, the regiment. And, and it just has me so excited because it's in environments like that where you really uh, are challenged the most. Yeah. And, and I, I feel myself grow the most. And you really learn yourself. What is it that I do that no one else can do? Yeah. What can I bring to the table in a special way to help the team? Yeah. Uh, so in those ways, uh, I'm really excited to be developed and, to to bring, uh, you know, my leadership style to the table and try to contribute. You know, the, the other thing that I would offer is I said, you know, it's, it's pretty neat to get a chance to serve in, in, in an organization like that. But, but the true, the true challenge and the charge is once you leave there, those that may never get an opportunity to ever serve in that organization, if you have had an opportunity, then I believe that you have a responsibility to share everything that you've learned and bring, you know, that experience you can to those that have never got a chance to understand or get a chance to see what that organization's about. And if you understand that truly, 
then you'll never stop. There will be never, there will never be a challenge that when somebody tells you no, all you hear is, you know, challenge accepted <laughs> as you're going through this. You'll look at things differently. And I believe that if you can take that everywhere else that you go, that's how you make teams better. You know, just like, it's, you know, you've, I guarantee you, and you've been to that comment with Coach K, when you, you have a shortcoming, you're going to go back, you're going to think through, you know, and, and this is what I always offer to the team. We may fall short on something, but it's like, go back, work the problem, you know, work the problem. There's something else that we're not doing that we're not seeing yet. There's a way that we're going to do this. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been assigned it and we were not being tasked with it. Right. And I, and I offer that to anybody. It doesn't matter what, what team you're on, but I think that you really get a chance to do that. And, and I think that you also, what you've experienced here is going to absolutely put you in that same type of pos position that you're ready to, you know, make decisions of sound judgment and manage risk. Yes, sir. Absolutely. When this guy takes off, you know, for Nick, when you, uh, when you're looking at the new lieutenants that are coming in, what are you going to offer Tim that says, Hey, you know, there was a guy named Marshall Plumley that was out here. Here's the things that he did well. And here's the things I think you can learn, learn from him. In my mind, sir, it doesn't change. Marshall Plumley's or me as a lieutenant. Yeah. It's the things that you can control. And I offer that to, to every lieutenant I've ever interacted with here, sir, is just attitude and effort. Yeah. What are you willing to do and what are you willing to endure? And you said it too, Marshall. And the day you step into a platoon, there's a day that you're going to leave that platoon. And more than likely, it's going to be well before you're ready to leave. So just cherish every moment, you know, that right. you spend time in the office, you, you want to get everything right on a con op, go have a meaningful conversation. Yeah. And I tell my guys that all the time and, yeah. and I need to remind myself and I have people like Marshall that are doing things like the marshmallow challenge that remind me like these little experiences are the things that I'm going to miss the most. Yeah. And it's just little moments like that. Soldiers are so interesting. They're so cool. And they're so much fun to be around. Go do it. And Give maximal effort in everything you do. Have a great attitude. There's there's no secret, and you've done it. Nelson's done it. Like all those guys in Seco have done that, and it's it's super humbling to see it, to be the leader, to see it come to what it has become is is a really humbling thing. Yes, sir. Paul, did you hear that? Always, sir. Maximum effort. Maximum effort. <laughs> it's been on LinkedIn. <laughs> hey, what is uh? Share, share with those that are coming into the team um, the importance of non-commissioned officers and then a relationship and in your development. Uh, non-commissioned officers. Uh, when you say when you say that, sir, immediately they're just faces and names that come to my mind, sir, uh, that have made my experience here a joy. Uh, and, and not because we've succeeded every time. We've definitely failed. But the group of NCOs that I have, sir, are, are the most fun to compete with and to take on challenges with. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about Staff Sergeant Nicholas, sir, uh, yeah. who's my weapon squad leader. Yeah. And uh, he is now two times won the brigade squad competition. So, it, and that's that's no small feat, you know, sir. It's yeah. it's designed. It's a smoker, and it's all <laughs> the you know squad leaders in the brigade, and he's won it twice, placed yeah. third once. And then the time you placed third, we wanted to dispute the scores. We think he should have gotten first again. <laughs> um, and I, uh, he's developed me with, with his words, but yeah. much more importantly with, uh, with his example. Yeah. Um, he has an ego about what he does well. You know, hey, I know some of these other guys think they're good at counseling their soldiers. Well, you know, Plumley, I'm the best. I'm the best at counseling my soldiers. And he would make it a point to show me every day how good he was at it. Yeah. He was quick and, and, you know, just immediate with any corrective action. And that rubbed off on me in a good way. Uh, and I, uh, you know, he had to steer me. I, I meant well a few times and he had to, you know, help me cross some T's and dot some I's and some of those counselings. But I would like to think, I'm not Staff Sergeant Nicholas, but I've added a little Staff Sergeant Nicholas to, you know, kind of my toolbox. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm extremely grateful for that. And it's something I would have never uh, brought to the table coming in as a lieutenant. Yeah. It, it's something that he's developed over his years as an NCO, seeing what works, what doesn't work. Yeah. And, and developing that ego and that persona, uh, that identity of this yeah. is the kind of leader I want to be. Uh, and when you're such a junior leader, I, I just I don't have that. 
and it's nice that he's willing to share that with me, sir. Yeah, I think you've made a lot of great points. I mean, the development of a lieutenant in preparation for them to become a company commander or continue to move on. I mean, NCO investment in an officer is incredibly, I mean, it's crucial to how you become and how you prepare. So you recognize that early on and the importance of listening to them, just being a sponge that as I've, I've offered, they're going to, they're going to echo and they're going to communicate and they're going to own the why and the purpose of things. But those, like, as you mentioned, you know, your non-commissioned officers are being the expert in how to do things. They're going to show you multiple techniques. They're going to show you multiple ways of how to solve these problems. And what they're doing is you're giving you paradigms, examples, you know, some concepts. So when you get into harder and more difficult situations, you can just continue to get after that stuff. And you'll never forget those individuals because the reason why those relationships will be, be more important is because they became so critical in the time of your development. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's great. And I appreciate that you recognize that early on. So I, I think that this, uh, you know, we've gone through this and everybody's got a chance to meet you, you know, and listen to your story and, and you've shared a lot of great stuff. One thing still like driving me crazy. I, I'm, I'm going back like seriously, like the Plumlee household, how much do they spend on groceries? <laughs> Didn't you have multiple fridges, you said? Yeah, One we, we had three refrigerators. And uh, for, for the early years of my life, we grew up on a farm, ended up moving away from the farm. But we still took advantage of everything that farm produced. So one <laughs> one refrigerator was strictly frozen beef to the brim, you know, full. And uh, my mom was a pharmacist and a dietitian, nutritious. She made sure we were eating the right things. And uh, yeah, it, it was a lot, sir. <laughs> I can't even imagine. I'm like, I'm thinking as we're approaching, you know, the holiday season, you know, you go to the Plumley household and like, what does Thanksgiving meal look like? You know, there's like four turkeys, you know, and like five hams. Yeah. And it's a little bit around the office. I know Captain Ando uh, can, can tell you, I, I definitely dominate some refrigerator space and probably microwave a few things. Uh, I shouldn't. I think I microwaved some salmon once and we had to throw away the microwave. Uh, might, might have ruined that one. Every meeting, sir. Every meeting. He would come in with a plate of like something. Four sausages from Costco or yeah. a bag of rice and microwaving salmon. I'd be like, yeah, Costco's been outside. great. People are like, Costco, you buy in bulk. I'm like, no, you buy in normal. This is how you <laughs> <Right>. eat. You <laughs> know? <laughs> well, hey, uh, you know, you mentioned one last thing that I wanted to share with the team that I thought was pretty uh, was pretty important. You know, you, you are an individual that has talked about putting pen to paper and writing down a lot of things. And I don't know where you've gotten that and who in, imparted or, you know, offered that to you early on. But I'll, I'll share with the team, you know, that, that – uh, you left me a, a letter that was handwritten, and it was, I was pretty touched by that. Um, there was nothing that was sucking up about it, but it was pretty pointed about, you know, the things you learned that you were appreciative of. And uh, I, I was pretty thankful and, and for, you know, a leader like me that, that doesn't get a chance to spend a lot of time with platoon leaders. It was it was pretty touching that you would offer just the time, you know, to, to, to put pen to paper and put some of those thoughts down. So I appreciate that. Yes, sir. The, uh, you talk about who instilled that in me. There are a couple of things. I'm a big believer in these thank you notes. One, Coach K, you know, with the, the hundreds of players he's had and, uh, you know, players that, <laughs> that scored way more points than me. They did more for Duke than I did. Every birthday, like clockwork, I always get a, a long handwritten thank you note from him. Uh, the most That's recent awesome. one, he's like, you know, hey, Plumlee, I'm proud of what you're doing out at JBLM. Thoughtful. Uh, and so he, he always did that, and I appreciated that. General Brown, always, every time I saw him, I was leaving with some kind of handwritten note. And I know he was famous within his organizations of everyone's birthday. He always wrote them, you know, a, uh, a handwritten note. Uh, but what, what really made me a believer in it, uh, if we have time for a story, sir. Absolutely. Um, when I was going through the NBA draft process, uh, I, I was determined to get drafted. Uh, and to do that, I knew I had to take care of business. I had to go through these pre-draft workouts, uh, and I, I had to show I was a good player. But on top of that, I wanted to make sure I did all the little things to kind of set me apart. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I went through these workouts, and if, if you're someone who's not really on the radar like me, I was trying to sneak into that draft, you have to work out a lot. You have to work out for every team. Uh, there isn't an opportunity you'll pass. I'll take whatever I can get. Mm -hmm. And I'm going in there, and I, I don't know if I was possessed or something, sir, but I was playing better basketball than I'd ever played my whole life. I, I was crushing it. Um, 
and I tried to do the little things as well. Uh, then draft night came and I didn't hear my name called and, and it, it hurt. Uh, and for a moment there, I had a really bad attitude for, for just a couple hours. I was asking myself, why did I do all these little things? Mm -hmm. Why did I go to the trouble? Uh, it, it, it didn't matter. Um, the next day I'm in the office with my agent and he's fielding calls from all these different teams trying to sign me. Uh, there, there, there's kind of a bidding war going on. Um, and ultimately I end up making out with a deal with the, with the New York Knicks that it, the way it worked out, it was the first 30 draft picks and Marshall Plumley that were signed to guarantee uh, multi-year contracts uh, because the second round is a great thing, but it's not guaranteed contract. I'm mm -hmm. like, how, how did you do that? You know, I'm asking my agent and, uh, he's telling me this, you know, all these teams, they got your handwritten thank you notes, uh, Plumley for each team you worked out for. Oh, wow. And they said they, you know, they'd never gotten anything like that before. Uh, I was at, um, you know, the Knicks practice facility. And, uh, you know, after the workout, I was in the cafeteria. I was in a good mood. I cleaned up the tables, pushed in the chairs before I left. I didn't know they, they'd caught me on camera doing that. Uh, and that's something else they saw. And it was for these little things, for the little things like the handwritten thank you notes and the little things like pushing in the chairs. Mm -hmm. They said, hey, we want. Marshall Plumley, uh, so that that made me a believer in those handwritten thank you notes uh, because it you know <laughs> with, without some of those little things I wouldn't have been afforded the opportunities I've been afforded, sir. That's an incredible story. I appreciate you sharing that, man, and, and taking the time to sit down and and reminisce a little bit. I know you you still kind of feel like you're under the pressure because Ando's here, not because you're talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's both intimidating <laughs> figures. <laughs> you know, so everybody that's listening, we always leave with you know what are your questions, but this one and and, and only time I'm going to allow uh, Lieutenant <laughs> Lieutenant Plumley the final words with you. Uh. Sir, I just want to say, you know, I said it in the note, but to say to you here face to face and the Captain Ando, thank you for allowing me to be a part of your team. Uh, thank you for surrounding me with competitors because I, I'm a firm believer. The awesome opportunities I've been afforded in my life isn't necessarily because Marshall Plumley's that great, but I, I've made a point to surround myself with awesome people, people who are better than I am. Uh, and because of that, you know, I've reached levels I didn't know I could reach. Uh, so I, I'm with a, a couple of those leaders in this room right now, uh, and I'm going to continue to pursue that the rest of my life to always chase being in that room where I'm not the smartest guy. I'm not the most talented. I'm challenged every day to step my game up, sir. Thanks, man. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. It's good. Good. Thank you for listening to the Leadership Experience. If you like what you heard, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with the newest podcast. The Leadership Experience will showcase professionals within five different subseries. Number one, Masters of Our Craft, the Essence of Warfighting. Number two, Students of Our Profession, as we understand organizational culture and concepts of leadership. Number three, Professional Athletes with Guns, as we talk hardships and maintaining a competitive advantage. Number four, Grit and Resiliency, the ability to overcome and perform under pressure. And number five, safe and secure environment as we talk soldier well-being and building trust within their organization and the profession as whole.